Okay, we are recording. Hi, everyone. This is the 17th um, uh, uh, gathering, a uh, Zoom gathering of the Grassroots Election Protection, Emergency Election Protection Coalition. Um, uh, I am a co convener. I'm Harvey Sluggo Wasserman with Joel Siegel, uh, who's I'm in uh, LA and Joel is in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. We are engineered by Mike Hirsch um, uh, and uh, co hosted uh, with, by Stephen Caruso as well. Steve, Mike is in. Uh, DC and Stephen, you're in uh, Central Ohio. So uh, we are glad to have everybody with us. And uh, uh, Mike has posted at the chat an, an article that I've got up right now at Reader Supported News, basically stating that the election has begun. Uh, we are seven weeks uh, from November 3rd, uh, but we are now officially in the election season which is about 50 days. And um, we are looking at uh, early voting and also uh, ballots have gone out in the mail. Um, and early voting uh, by all accounts now is gonna be a huge factor in, in this upcoming, in this election. Um, the polls showed that as many as uh, uh, half the people who had originally said that they were going to be um, er, uh, voting by mail may now actually early vote, which uh, as far as in terms of election protection is a very good thing. Uh, that means people are going in and voting. Hopefully they're getting paper ballots. That's a major issue. Um, when you early vote, what do they give you? Do they give you a touch screen, um, which we know when my co-writer Bob Petrakis is on, um, and we have done uh, quite a bit, of, we've had quite a bit of uh, experience with touchscreen machines, which we refer to as push and pray. We, we really don't know what the outcome <clears throat> is gonna be uh, when you push it on a, on a uh, touchscreen machine. You don't know where your vote goes, you don't know who counts it, you don't know if they fractionalize it, what they do with it. We are major, in terms of election protection, and our, our um, uh, site, the grassroots, Emergency Election Protection Coalition or grassrootsep.org, we uh, very strongly advocate <clears throat> for paper ballots everywhere. And we hope that the people going into early vote are getting paper ballots. Uh, that's something we need to advocate for. Um, um, it, it looks like uh, the um, uh, Republicans are already talking about major fraud in, um, especially in Nevada. Uh, where everyone will be mailed a vote and in Florida, which is uh, really um, uh, up in the air. And we have Susan Pinchon, uh, who's going to talk to us about Florida um, uh, later on. So the bottom, we, we're, we're going to also talk about poll workers. We're going to talk about the youth vote. Bernie Sanders has raised, raised an issue. We're going to talk about mailings from this group NVI, which nobody can figure out. Uh, there's a group called, I wanted to discuss called the Democratic associations of secretaries of state, which is being pushed by Eric Holder and Barack Obama. Uh, I watched an hour of a, a presentation from Alicia Keys last night. Uh, we wanna talk about Michael Moore, voting in the arenas, yard signs, and then we'll have state reports from uh, the key, st key states, North Carolina, Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Wisconsin's big, big uproar in Wisconsin, and also Leo, since the re great Reverend Leo yeah, Woodbury's on the call. We'll talk about South Carolina as well. And then finally, uh, we will have a forum. And my, Bob Petrakis is, uh, is also going to talk to us. There's been repeated questions about what happens if um, uh, Trump refuses to leave the White House. What national, what na nonviolent um, uh, tactics could be used? And uh, Bob is going to talk to us about uh, the general strike, which is, uh, ha has happened in American history, certainly a very powerful reality in European history and something uh, that we um, uh, need to talk about. I just got a, an email uh, uh, window in my upper right-hand corner, the title of which is Trump rebukes California leaders on wildfires. Uh, I guess, I guess of those of us in California did not rake up enough leaves to prevent this uh, Holocaust in the forests. Uh, but I, I have no interest in discussing that on this call. So uh, as I say, we're now seven weeks out, 50 days, and the, the election has begun. 
Does anyone want to uh, uh, um, make any kind of comment or report on early voting? Has anybody early voted yet? And do we know if people going into the polls are getting paper ballots or are they getting machines? Or are they being forced to vote on machines? Has anybody been specifically seen anything about the realities of early voting? Ivy, I can jump in from the state Please. of North Carolina. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We don't begin early voting until October 15th, and no, we will not have paper ballots. It will be the machine. The only time paper will be used is for provisional ballots uh, or the absentee. And uh, while we are encouraging uh, absentee voting, um, we are experiencing delays with the post office, which I think, you know, we're not the only ones experiencing that. And of course, um, 45 came to Wilmington, North Carolina and encouraged our voters to vote twice. So our state is already set up um, to, to have fraud um, as its culprit because of his statement. So um, October 15th, we will have in Mecklenburg County 33 um, polling places open and available for persons to come to our sports um, personnel, the Panthers and the Hornets have also um, provided their stadiums. So we will have the stadiums as well. That's the report. Okay, so have Charlie. people been receiving paper ballots yet in the mail? We have been receiving. As a matter of fact, I think I get a um, application every other week. So I think I'm collecting them now. <laughs> I'm getting them. Yeah. yeah. That, we were uh, didn't wanted to discuss that, but first of all, um, the uh, are people able legally to take your paper ballot and walk it in? Is there a place where you can walk it in? Well, you can take it to the Board of Elections. And on um, and the law, based on the Board of Elections, is that the only person who can handle your absentee ballot application and your absentee ballot will be the um, the recipient or a member of their family. So, in other words, I cannot go and pick up uh, dozens from others and take it down there. But you could. Um, can you apply and then get a ballot and, and leave it at the same time? I can apply for it, get it, and um, take it down. I know there is a deadline date, which I don't have to give at this report. I can look it up and try to bring that to you before we end. Um, there is a deadline date to turn it in, and you can physically turn in the um, absentee ballot. At the election stations? And it would go, it would actually go to the, um, I'm sorry, it would actually go to the Board of Elections. No, it would not be turned into the, the sites. Okay. Now the sites are going to open October 15th and that includes the two arenas. Yes. The football stadium and the basketball stadium. Yes. But those will not be open on election day. No. The, okay. Only your precincts uh, will be open on election day. Okay. But we are urging people to vote before election day. We are, especially in North Carolina, because you have the opportunity to register and vote. Um, during early voting. So if you um, miss that, that window to register to vote, you have that opportunity. And so we are, we are strongly encouraging um, our community to early vote. That way you get a chance to check to see if your name has been um, taken off the roll. If it has, you can register on the spot and vote at the same time. Right. And uh, uh, there, are you getting any cooperation from the Democratic Party? And are there any PSAs on the air about this? <laughs> um, not very many um, PSAs at the moment. However, um, I'm a part of several groups where we are working to make sure that um, folks know to vote and to early vote. So with my um, State Baptist Association, we are working out a plan now to get all of our churches on board to um, give information, a sample ballot as well as um, the locations where they can vote. So that's an initiative that has started as early as um, today, putting that plan in action so that we can be ready by the time the polls open October 15th. And then are, other groups are doing the same thing. Are any of the days that the polls will be available for early voting on Sundays? Um, I think we still have, um, initially when they started out with two Weekends, we had two Sundays, but I think we will have um, two Sundays, and I can double check that too because we were fighting for that 
we had initially had two Sundays and they took it away and gave us one Sunday. I think we have that back and I'll double check for us. And what about before October 15th? Is, are there any of the election boards open on Sundays? No. Okay. And, not, uh, and none will be open. Um, well, I'll find out about early voting if they're open on Sundays and what those Sundays are. Good. Okay. Anybody else got, uh, in, uh, Joel, did you want to jump in? Joel Siegel from Charlotte? Yeah. Uh, on the situation and and then and, and Leo Woodbury, you can talk talk to us about. We might as well do the state reports now. Thank you for that. That extremely yeah. helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw Jan too. Um, ben Dor had her hand up, but um, Leo, why don't you go ahead and I'll follow. Yeah, because I have to actually I have a board call. I have to jump on. So okay. in South Carolina, our legislators are, are meeting um, on tomorrow to decide whether or not early voting will begin on October 5th or September 28th. So oh. we're, we actually have a coalition of people um, who will be having a press conference at the State House with some legislators to uh, move the, the uh, date up to September 28th, especially in light of the fact that November 3rd is still hurricane season and there's no guarantee that um, people won't be uh, in experiencing torrential rains or hurricanes or floods. So we're really focused on getting people out to vote early. For absentee um, ballots, um, we are allowed, there, there's a, what well, we have to witness, if you are not a paid campaign staff worker and the voter agrees we can have someone help who's not a family relative and they can take that um, sealed envelope to the election commission. We had a lot of success doing that during the primary and uh, subsequent uh, runoffs. And um, so we, we are advocating that people vote early and that we hand deliver as many absentee ballots as possible so we're not feeding red meat to the Republican Party so that they can cry rigged election um, next year. We're also working with the coalition of um, organizations statewide, working with Andre uh, uh, Miller and others. So we're going to be purchasing, um, she's already started, we're gonna have uh, $15,000 worth of uh, digital billboards That'll be up in uh, the four largest metropolitan areas. Um, October 5th, we'll be having uh, Souls to the Polls, where we're asking uh, faith leaders and nonprofit organizations in Greenville, Spartanburg, Columbia, Charleston, and Florence to commit to taking at least uh, five of their congregants or parishioners to the polls. And so we're going to be doing that simultaneously on October 5th at noon, all across the state. Um, the other thing is that we'll be doing, um, we'll have a number uh, that'll be on the car magnets for calls to the poll, uh, for souls to the poll. And people who call that number will be able um, to get assistance um, filling out an application so they can get an absentee ballot or uh, transportation if they want to early vote or register to vote or get transportation on November 3rd. And um, Andrea Miller's group has an amazing app that we'll be using. I know also in North Carolina that works like Uber or Lyft. And so once we have uh, recruited the volunteer drivers throughout the state. People who call that number will be directed to someone who can come and pick them up and the driver will have turn by turn direction to the polling place that they're, they're going to. So we're working really hard on uh, getting our common messaging and having one number, phone number, one uh, hashtag, one uh, hashtag, that can be used all around the state to um, get people out to vote early. That's fantastic. You know, if you, if you could ha uh, write that up 
<clears throat> give, give us uh, somehow a written document of, of what your game plan is, I think that would be useful all over the country. Okay, because thank it, you. We'll be, we'll be happy to do that. That would be fantastic. We'll put it up on the internet. We'll put it on, on this list and we'll make it available to all the election protection groups. Where, um, you know, that would be wonderful uh, um, uh, because uh, that's really, this is the, the game plan that people need. Yeah, let me add one more thing. We're also working with a group called Green Face out of, um, uh, a Green Face out of um, New Jersey. And, and I serve on the board of directors there. Um, we're working on, we're still trying to get research, but we're working on having what we call uh, moral witnesses. We, we will be asking uh, faith leaders, those same faith leaders, to get people to volunteer uh, watching at the poll. And if they see anything uh, that is suspicious or questionable or just plain wrong, they'll be able to... Um, take a picture, make a video, and then also um, send that to a, a website, and I'm sorry, to email it, and also call a number where there'll be uh, legal services available. So we'll, we'll be glad to write all that up. Yeah, that sounds really, really great. Um, uh, uh, very, very important in, um, you know, South Carolina, if you flip South Carolina, uh, there'll be a lot of nervous breakdowns in, in many Republican <laughs> headquarters. <laughs> Jamie Harrison is doing a good job making people nervous. Well, that's good, but you're, you're at the grassroots and that's where it really counts. We really appreciate your work and, and if maybe by in a week, if we could have your memo, uh, we will be having these meetings every week from now for the duration. So um, uh, this is critical information, Leah. One, one question. When people go in to vote in person in South Carolina, do they get paper or they, are they, do they have to vote on a machine or do they get a choice? Um, for, for the primaries and the runoff, they actually got paper um, ballots. I don't know if that's going to continue. We'll find out after the legislature meets tomorrow and perhaps next week because we're also having difficulty. We have drop boxes. I understand there's about 50,000 drop boxes and we're trying to get them to um, to uh, put those drop boxes out, especially in rural areas where people might have to drive 20, 30 miles to a polling location and it'll be less apt to do so, especially with COVID. So um, I'll, I can write up what we have, but we'll have additional information after the legislature meets tomorrow and hopefully they'll settle everything tomorrow and won't push it into next week as well well as as we've mentioned you know if you can get them to give you a paper ballots there's a big argument a health argument against the the touch screens also which is you've had people successively touching the screen you could uh, transmit the covid so, you know, wherever you can get paper ballots and digital scanning machines, that's what we're hoping for. Absolutely. That way we know the machines, the machines haven't been rigged and the Russians can, uh, can't tamper. So, yes. Okay. Any, anybody want to ask Leo anything about South Carolina? And I, I do. Plan there? Yeah, Joel? Hi, Leo. Thank you for coming on the call. Um, Leo, can you explain how the black communities in South Carolina and North Carolina are basically uh, forgotten and left out by the Democratic Party and, and the progressive movement in terms of funding so you could do an on the ground game that could actually get black voters to the polls because I feel like it's, it's a hidden fact but it needs to be stated more honestly. Yeah, I, well, you know, particularly when you look at a state like South Carolina that is isn't a swing state and that a lot of people just look at and say it's ruby red and outside of the, the presidential primary people don't expect much and where they don't expect much they don't they don't invest their, their finances but you know as i said earlier we we have a quarter of a million people who are unregistered who are unregistered voters who 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 we can swing this state with 
Um, you know, I'm sad to say that all of the monies that we've been able to acquire um, for our get out the vote effort across the state, none of it has come from the Democratic Party. And so, you know, it's really hard to organize, mobilize, and move communities, communities together um, to make change when those communities are already under-resourced, greatly under-resourced. And so um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just hoping that uh, Jamie Harris's success over Lindsey Graham, how we swung Joe Cunningham's district down in the Charleston area, we're just hoping that as, as we make progress and we make change that the Democratic Party would take a different view. Um, and, uh, and in a lot of cases, like the region where we live, the PD region, which is overwhelmingly Democratic, um, people just generally just take uh, the votes of people of color for granted uh, with the Democratic Party. And I know that you guys know that part of the Republican strategy now is to um, talk to those disenchanted um, people of color, particularly African-American males. You may see something on the news where the Republican Party nationally are saying that if they can swing 5% of disgruntled African-American uh, males into their camp, that that will greatly increase Trump's chances of winning. So if we don't uh, if the Democratic Party doesn't become more and more engaged, we're, we're going to lose. Um, we're going we're to start to lose African American and people of color vote, voters. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. Please. Um, um, Reverend, um, I, th I love the name uh, Moral Witness for your polling people. I think that's excellent. Are you having planned training for them of what exactly they're going to be doing when they catch? problems that they're going to report? Do you have a training? Yes, Green, yes, Green Faith is going to do some training. And we have parts of the state like where, where, where we live and operate in Florence County. Um, they're throwing, you know, they're blowing dog whistles. They're, um, they're um, using bullhorns. Literally, all of the Democratic candidates uh, run it Right, the new ones running for state house um, are women and African Americans. The entire slate of of uh, Democratic candidates in in Florence County, which is the fourth largest um, metropolitan area in the state, all of the candidates are African American, with the exception of one. And on the Republican side, um, on the Loretta show on the list, uh, on the Republican side, every Republican candidate is a white male with the exception of one. And so we're really in a battle in terms of diversity and, um, and, and those sorts of things. They're pouring a lot of money into key parts of, of the state. If, and if, our, our Democratic candidates win. Um, the Democratic Party will be this county council and the city council and the mayor will all be African Americans overwhelmingly. We're talking about five out of seven seats on the city council and four out of, out of seven seats on the county council and so on. And imagine, right. imagine how much more communities we could have like that if we could register people and we had the resources. Reverend, I, I, I just said this is really excellent, but in terms of training people, um, there's very specific things to be looking for, and it's very complicated because I know I've been studying it myself. Do you have specific training that you're going to be giving them? Because that is something that I'm actually working on with a number of people, and um, it sounds like what you're doing is, is, is right on, but I'm asking, do you have specific training about what to be looking for? There's no the, tra the, the training is supposed to be conducted by Green Faith, but if you can assist us, we, that would be more than welcome. I am, I am not an expert in, in, in uh, that area at all. I'm, 
I'm a community grassroots organizer that's, and, and, and a preacher. That's basically it. <laughs> and can you put their contact in the chat or can somebody put the contact of Green Faith in the chat so I know? Um, okay, uh, you, do you have the phone number? Okay, I'm gonna have to pull up the number. Or can you, can you give us, can you tell us your email address and I'll sure. get, get it sure. to you? Perfect. And I have to, mm -hmm. and I don't mean to cut it off, but I need to be on this board call where I'm the executive, on the executive committee, and we're supposed to be making a decision about our strategic plan. Perfect. So my name is Jennifer Tanner, and my email is JJ Tanner with a T, 18, the number 18, at gmail.com. Okay, JJ Tanner, 18, 18 at gmail.com. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Guys, I hate to run, but you know, it's- well, You've been spectacular. Join us again next week, please. Give us okay. the updates. We have, you know, it, it looks hard, but we have seven weeks. Seven yeah. weeks is a lifetime in politics, as mm -hmm. they say. Okay, thank you yeah. so much, Reverend. Since okay, we started- Okay, thank you. Keep up your great work. Since we started, in, let's do the state-by-state state reports. And then we'll go to the other stuff. Joel, do you want to continue with North Carolina and yeah. tell us what's going on there? And then we'll go to Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and really Wisconsin. There's a big, big news in Wisconsin. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, th thanks for keeping us all together, Harvey. And uh, there's, all there's right. a, lot, a lot of work. Uh, first of all, Glenn Rhetoric is, um, in terms of her work with um, the Center for Common Ground, they, they really are doing phenomenal work in terms of trying to get the purge list, which has just taken forever. Uh, there are over 600,000 people purged in North Carolina. And I think they finally got the purge list. So what they're tr doing is they're sending out thousands of postcards to that purge list and trying to re-register people who don't know that they've been purged. So that's one of the most important things that's happening. The second thing that's happening is uh, we, we have a coalition now. It's about uh, maybe 30, organization strong, former Secretary of State, um, almost all the nonprofit voting rights groups, um, African American Caucus, the Postal Unions. Many of you actually been on those calls. I'll just tell you the two projects that we're about to do. Um, the biggest problem that we have here, and I would say it is not a problem, it's a crisis. In the African American community and in every community that we've surveyed, there is mass confusion about the absentee ballot. People are getting the ballot and they're throwing them in the trash can because they think that it's um, some kind of a you know, solicitation. And as much as we want to protect the vote, we also want to make sure that there are enough people to actually vote that we can protect. So this is not a problem, this is a crisis. So in other words, there could be literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people that will not vote uh, because they didn't know about the absentee ballot process. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold a, like a rock the vote. We were going to do a webinar, but we decided that that would be very boring. So we're going to get some uh, local musicians. Uh, we have got a, we don't have that, we don't have any resources. So we're asking that it be done strictly, you know, by volunteers. Then we're just going to, we're going to have uh, music then we're going to get people to actually teach people how to go through the ballot process, both from filling it out to where they drop it off the day of and after. We're also going to use that as an opportunity to recruit people to work at the polls. This is probably one of the best ways to recruit people quickly to either be um, poll watchers or poll monitors. So, we're gonna do this intensive education. We have our event planned. It's gonna, I think it might take about two and a half weeks. We're rounding up the musicians now. Um, so this is gonna be organized by the interfaith community and the multi uh, national international community. So we've never done this before. So it's gonna be very, very um, interesting to see what happens. But at the same time, what we're gonna to do too is we're taking groups of people um, to the board of elections we're gonna meet with them and we're gonna ask them, do they know about Mark Zuckerberg's grant? But I think it's 250 million, I think Harvey told us. And, and if they yeah. go to Zuckerberg, they can get money to train 
poll workers. Where I do have a disagreement with some of the people in North Carolina, um, the Charlotte Observer said that th there's a crisis of not having enough poll workers. And even though the county, even though they pay people, uh, they used to have senior citizens that did that work, but most of them are not going to work because of the fear of COVID. So that is a real serious problem. And if we don't get enough poll workers, there could be uh, weeks and weeks and weeks before we get <coughs> one. That's what happened in New York, in the state of New York. The third thing that we're trying to do is we want to train poll monitors on the day of the election to just be there. They would have a yellow ribbon. We're not, we're working with the existing organizations who already do this. Uh, Harvey has raised some money so that we can make sure this could be done successfully, but we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to give it to organizations that are already doing this. We'll have to see who those organizations are, and we're talking to them literally this week. Um, so I'll just close by saying, believe it or not, I'm quite, I'm pretty optimistic because, you know, we, it seems like a very hard task and it, there's all these barriers, but once we formed the coalition, we brought in the uh, NAACP, we brought in so many different organizations and we, it turned out that everybody was doing similar things, they just weren't connected. And Harvey, you were very helpful on the last call and making sure that people kind of understood what our priorities are. I'll close by saying, one thing I've learned about this whole process and this journey of election protection, there's gonna, there's gonna need to be the creation of a pass-through foundation funded by people like Tom Steyer, LeBron James. If we can't depend on, and even though we are 501c3, the either party, Democrat or Republican, we cannot depend on them to fund an election protection project. We can't depend on them to do GOTV. Having worked in the party for 40 years and, and worked with the DNC for 13, they put their money into TV commercials and, and lawyers. They don't, they don't pay money, they don't give money to people like Glancy, who knows her community or Leo Woodbury, who is organized throughout the state of South Carolina. That's why there's so many close races with progressives who could win, because we're not getting the black vote out and the Hispanic vote, because that's a big deficit, that's a big hole in the Democratic Party. All that being said, since we're nonpartisan, that's going to mean, that means we're going to have to do that. Unless there's funding in the future, it has to be in the tens of millions, and we can get that money, it's not going to happen, but I'm optimistic. I think we can make it happen. It's just that we're going to have to do it ourselves. That's my report. All right. Very good. Anybody else from North Carolina? Thank you, Joel. You're welcome. Uh, Susan, I had a question. Have... Sorry, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, this is, this was, um, and by the way, hi, Harvey and uh, hi. Bob. I haven't seen you guys since 2004, 2005. Um, so Joel, the, it was pretty frightening to hear that so many of these absentee ballots or vote by mail ballots are thrown out. In California, if that happens, you can always go and vote provisionally uh, in person the day of. Uh, do you know what the law is in your state or other states like that? Yeah, I had a long conversation with Mimi Kennedy about that. And I'm, I'm not an expert on provisional ballots, but you're supposed to be able to fill them out. But here's the problem. If you fill out a provisional ballot, there's a very good chance that they won't count them. We get them counted here in California. They even post on the SOS website uh, that it's been it's been counted. But I know we're a little bit better than other states. So I, I, yeah, I'll give you an example. L let's say you applied for uh, an absentee ballot, but you didn't get it. If you go to you know to vote, and the the person says, "I'm sorry, but you can't vote twice because you applied for." An, an absentee ballot and the person says, well, I didn't get it. That's going to be part of our training is we've got to train people what happens when they actually go to the polls. They have to say, please, we need a provisional ballot. Our job as election protection activists is to make sure that the provisional ballots are not thrown out, that, but they're actually counted. It, it is a, Harvey, you probably, and, and Bob, you guys know more about the provisional ballots, but Mandeep, thank you for that question. Thank you, Joel. Thanks for all Bob your work. Dr. you want to talk about provisional ballots? It's a national problem. 
Well, can I say something about North Carolina before we hear yes, from a personal perspective? Go ahead. So um, the problem with provisional, no one really trusts that their, their votes would be counted. But um, when an absentee ballot is requested, the individual still has the choice rather to um, mail the absentee ballot in or to go into um, to vote early. However, um, in looking at our information, the last day for an absentee ballot to be turned in is um, October 31st. So they would not be able to um, take the ballot in at that time. They would have to physically go in and vote. So even if they request the, the ballot, get the ballot, they still have an opportunity to either use the ballot or go in and vote, but they must do it before um, the 31st of October. Um, to mail it in, it has to be mailed in by the 27th. And so those are the things that are not clearly explained to the community, should they decide that they don't want to, or should they decide that they want to um, use the absentee ballot and not go vote on November the 3rd, their vote won't be counted unless it is mailed by the 27th or hand delivered by the 31st. Um, and the deadline for registering the vote is October the 9th. So our greatest window to, um, to do our best job in North Carolina is to use that window of opportunity during early voting where the participant has the opportunity to either use his absentee ballot or not, or um, find out if they have been um, um, uh, expunged from the roll, they have an opportunity to uh, re-register and vote at the same time. So really for North Carolina, our push really should be focused on early voting. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the paper ballot. We do have the touch screen. We did get the uh, an upgrade system that is probably upgrade for North Carolina and dated for other areas where um, we have a blank sheet of paper that um, we stick into the machine that records what we check on the ballot. So you have an opportunity to look at it then it goes in another, in another machine to be counted. However, North Carolina right now has a lawsuit um, for that company because we still find that it's able to be hacked and votes changed. So uh, we're kind of in a hard rock, between a hard rock and whatever that little cliche is. <laughs> yeah, so and, and also people should know that if you're gonna walk in your paper ballot, you need to bring the envelope as well. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, they're going to give you a provisional. So you need yeah. to bring everything and whatever ID that they may may ask for. Uh, Jan Bendor has put a long uh, thing in the chat here. Uh, Jan, can you uh, talk? With, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, um, uh, uh, Jan Bendor, do you want to jump in here from Michigan? And then you can also tell us what's going on in Michigan. Well, thank you, Harvey. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about provisional ballots, and I think it will help if you read the Help America Vote Act. Uh, a provisional ballot should never be used for a person whose registration is already established in that jurisdiction. Uh, that is uh, a no-no, but the provisional ballot has been abused all over the country for the wrong reasons. If a person uh, originally got uh, an absentee ballot, didn't bring it, uh, th then they should be given an affidavit to swear that they can't find it, the dog ate it, or some such. And they should be given a regular ballot. Uh, there's also such a thing as a challenged ballot, where that person's residency has been challenged, or various other things. A challenged ballot is voted just like any other ballot, but it will be given a special mark, and that mark covered with tape. So if there's a court challenge, that ballot can be retrieved. Provisional ballots make me crazy. I think we've got to get rid of them. They're, they're absolutely uh, only abused and they, they haven't helped anybody as far as I can tell. Um, let me just give you a quick update about Michigan. Uh, we will be uh, getting our absentee ballots out on September 24th. We expect two thirds of Michigan voters to vote by absentee. So that could be as many as 5 million voters. And uh, thanks to our 2018 constitutional amendment that we passed, uh, we uh, made it possible for every voter to get an absentee ballot for no reason whatsoever. And uh, we also have election day registration. 
which is done at the office of the local clerk. So you can go to the local clerk on election day, you can register and you can vote your ballot right there. Uh, okay, that's- let me, jump in. let me ask you, you say election day, does that include early voting as well? Can you okay, go before let's be clear day? what early voting means. This makes me crazy. Uh, in Michigan, early voting is essentially absentee voting on paper, always, we have nothing else. And you uh, can come in on September 24th, as soon as the ballots are available, and you can vote your absentee ballot in person uh, at the clerk's office. That's our version of early voting. But we will not have live tabulators. That would be a violation of Michigan election law. Imagine the nightmare if the tabulators are turned on and then they're left on for three or four weeks. Uh, the machines don't do well under those conditions and they're not designed to turn on and off. <laughs> If you turn them off, then the next day you're starting a whole new election and they, we have no way to uh, accumulate all of those daily totals. So that is not possible, even if it were legal. And you're not gonna get two election inspectors from different parties to babysit the machine all night. So <laughs> I think there'd be a lot of resistance to that kind of early voting. So we're just doing early voting on paper sealed absentee ballots. The one thing that we're, that I'm very disappointed about is after years of trying, my organization has not been able to get uh, a provision that would allow any person with an early absentee ballot to come in and put it through the tabulator in test mode to make sure they don't make a mistake. So that's a disadvantage for early absentee on paper voters. They can't see if they've overvoted races. Uh, if, if they have made other mistakes, like uh, uh, invalid marks, you can't make a check mark. It usually doesn't work. So that's something we've been trying to correct so that we can help people avoid mistakes. Uh, what we're doing uh, primarily this time is we're trying to protect uh, communities of color in Michigan. Uh, we have about seven areas in our state that are historically underserved by any kind of honest elections. Uh, my organization for the last almost 15 years has been training election challengers. We call them mirror monitors. They know exactly what's supposed to happen at every stage uh, of election day. And they will actually raise objections when they see things going wrong. Uh, whether it's having people vote with pencils, which is against the law, it might be a, a stack of blank ballots left in the middle of the room. All kinds of nutty stuff goes on. Uh, when we trained local challengers in Benton Harbor, Michigan, which is uh, across from Chicago, uh, a community that has always been run by the Whirlpool Corporation and the elections corrupted by them, the, peop the residents said it was the first honest election they'd had in 30 years. So monitoring makes a huge difference. We've also trained people in Detroit which by the way is the second largest uh, African-American majority community in the United States after Philly, uh, 480,000 voters. <laughs> if we don't get uh, Detroit voters out, uh, we're not gonna win my state. And so that's, that's really our biggest priority. Okay, and Mi Michi I, I, it's my belief that Michigan and North Carolina uh, could very well uh, uh, decide this election. It's great you're there in Michigan and we need we need more people on the case. Um, we're gonna zip through the rest. Can I, can I interject here for a second, Harvey? Very quickly, yes, Marion. Um, yeah, just on the subject of tabulators, one okay. very important thing we need to be advocating right now before the elections is to election officials to make sure to disconnect their tabulators, their roles, all of this from the internet. If they're, because a lot of the wireless modems the uh, ES and S and other companies have been selling election officials wireless modems. If they're connected to the internet, it makes hacking very easy. Um, the Russians are already looking into these opportunities and working on it. We got to uh, make sure that election officials disconnect their tabulators from the internet. And Absolutely. that's something we should all be advocating for now. This isn't prep stuff. This is stuff we need to make sure that they understand now. Yes. Thank, Thank, you Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Marion. We've been there's doing no that. But there's another problem related to that. If your local election administrator uh, has not programmed their ballots in-house by sworn personnel, 
and they've had an outside consultant do it as we had for 10 years. There were only two consultants who did the entire state for all seven and a half million voters and they were not sworn and nobody knew what they were connected to. And that's another source of malware and hacking and uh, we got to be very careful with all this stuff. Thank you. Well, okay, let's add that to our ask. But we need to find out who the local election officials are. And we have to have people who don't identify themselves as Democrat or Republican. They just say they're concerned about honest elections, urging them not to let the Russians or anybody else hack the elections. If you talk about foreign interference, there's more of a chance that they would listen, regardless of what party, that they need to disconnect from the internet. And I agree, you know, and thank you for that add on. Thank you. Yeah, I, and, um... I want to say, you know, we're covering this state by state, but all these are generic issues. And they're, they're, uh, so I hope we'll all stick with it because it's not just Michigan and North Carolina at stake here and South Carolina. This stuff goes all across the country. And, and thank you so much, Jan and, and, um, and Marion, uh, for that. Um, um, uh, and you, you even have a, a Democratic governor and secretary of state in Michigan. So uh, hopefully uh, things can be uh, uh, dealt with uh, fairly, but uh, it's going to take a in Detroit, it's going to take a big ish, big uh, push. Don't so, trust that. I'll yeah. give you the background when you want it. <laughs> yeah, not now. But it, again, it's this is this is nitty gritty stuff. It's state by state, but a lot of it is generic. In Pennsylvania, we have uh, and oh, I'm sorry, Florida. Do we have Susan Pinchon? Real quick, I want to see if we can get this done um, in, in another ten minutes. We do have a serious issue in Wisconsin that's going to affect the whole country that we need to talk about, but. Um, Susan Pinchon, can you give us a quick a wrap on, on, on Florida? And then we'll do Pennsylvania, and then we'll go to Wisconsin. Susan Pinchon, are you on? OK, let's, let's go to Pennsylvania. Annabelle and Muriel. Um, Annabelle Park and Muriel. OK, uh, Muriel is going to give us the update on Pennsylvania. Muriel, Muriel, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet Hi, everybody. Muriel. OK, so what's happening in Pennsylvania? I'm with a group called Protect Our Vote Philly. We are based in Philadelphia. We've been around for a year and a half. We started by uh, advocating for handmarked paper ballots, and then we became a watchdog of our uh, Board of Elections. So I can only speak really to Philadelphia and our efforts here. Basically, our board uh, doesn't follow the election code and doesn't, find the, doesn't follow the Sunshine Act, and we're trying to get um, politicians to care about it, and we're shut out by the media. But what we're concerned about is if they handle the, the November election like they handled the June canvas, we're going to be in a load of trouble. We think that that's going to open us up to legal challenges. Um, so we're, we're just doing our best to um, make the, uh, the elected officials aware. So we do have a Democratic governor, Democratic uh, secretary of state, but that doesn't seem to matter. Um, no, it did in 2016. And um, recently we just launched a... Um, a uh, project to uh, save digital ballot images. So we wrote to the Department of State, we wrote to all the counties, letting them know the law, uh, federal and state law, so that uh, we are hoping to educate them and to encourage them to save ballot images as uh, vital election records. And that's thanks to John Brakey and Susan Pynchon at, um, and Audit Elections USA. So hopefully that's going to be a, a, a good development. We did hear back from Philadelphia that they saved their ballot images. We just need to confirm if they're talking about all the ballot images. So that's a little nuance there that um, they might have some wiggle room on and we want to pin them down. Do you have a coalition in Pennsylvania that's working on election protection? Are there other groups? Because what so, we could do, uh, Steve Caruso's on the phone, on the line. We can uh, set up a Zoom call for you if you can get all the groups in the state working on election protection so we can network. That would be great. All right, so if you'll get to us and um, uh, email me and Steve and we'll, we'll set up with you a Zoom call for all, everybody in Pennsylvania. And certainly Annabelle uh, has the skills on, on social networking. Okay? Excellent, we appreciate right. that. Thank you so much, we appreciate it. Annabelle, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, um, I just, I wanted to add that um, we have tools that we developed to help people get out the vote and to go over election rules with people. It's called 100 Voters Project and I put that in the link. And we're also doing social media disinformation training that are free and online. 
And I would love for everyone to join and see if we can work together to do rapid response on social media to counter disinformation. Great, wonderful. Yeah. I've worked with Annabelle. She had me on her Facebook page and um, you know, I'm probably the oldest person she ever uh, interviewed, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, and you're in Pittsburgh. Okay. You're yes, in I'm in Pittsburgh. So let's build a, a Pennsylvania network. We'll do a Zoom call for you and we'll really build this up, okay? Okay, awesome, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Lulu Freestad is on. I wanted to introduce Lulu if you're real quick. Um, uh, Lulu does a, a great work. She has her own Zoom calls. Uh, Lulu, are you with us? Uh, do you need to be unmuted? I'm here, Harvey. Thank you for okay. having me. Okay, Th this is the, the great Lulu, the legendary Lulu. Are you in, P you're in Pennsylvania also, yeah? No, I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, all right, the, well, I was close. Anyway, um, so Lulu, when do you do your, uh, your Zoom calls? Uh, they're on YouTube and on Facebook uh, simultaneously, and they're every other Tuesday night. So the next one is going to be September 22nd at 7 p.m. This one is going to go over audits. It, this is called our election protection series, and you can watch all of them on our YouTube channel. If you just go to YouTube and look for Smart Elections, uh, there's a playlist there. So we're up to, I think, ep episode seven now. and. I'm really excited about who's going to be on the call. We're going to have Virginia Martin talking about full hand count audits. We're going to have Stephanie Singer uh, from Verified Voting talking about risk limiting audits. Stephanie's my favorite person to talk about risk limiting audits because she actually makes them comprehensible. And she also was an election official in Philly for years. And so she knows about all of the dirty dealings that go on. Uh, so well, she'll talk about that sometimes. Okay, Lou, you put your YouTube channel on the uh, in the uh, chat. Uh, Laura Chamberlain's requesting it. Okay. Yeah. Can I just put the? I'll put that in there where you can watch the past episodes. And could I also just put where you register for the YouTube calls? Yeah. It's and, great and, if you register also, ahead of time. Put your own uh, contacts because you're a great resource. Okay. Thanks so much, Harvey. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go. We're we, we're really going to race here. Uh, is, is anybody here in Wisconsin? Um, uh, what has happened in Wisconsin, I'm sure many of you have seen it, but it just broke today, is the Wisconsin Supreme Court uh, has issued a horrendous decision, four to three, of course, uh, that um, is thrown the whole Wisconsin election into chaos. And um, the, the Green Party has, uh, it's, a, it's based on the Green Party, and I'm sure that the, the reaction against green politics is going to be uh, gargantuan. Uh, I urge everybody to look it up. We're not going to go into great detail today because uh, it is a total nightmare. Um, but uh, we will, uh, at some point, uh, uh, post, uh, we'll post at uh, Grassroots EP all the articles uh, that have to do with it. But uh, this could actually affect the entire election. If anybody knows anybody in the Green Party, uh, please contact me. Um, and we'll have to figure out what we're going to ask them to do. Uh, and maybe we want, we will at some, I'm sure they're already being asked to withdraw and, and to allow this chaos in Wisconsin to clear up. Uh, but um, uh, if anybody knows anything about it, wants to chime in right now, uh, this is a nightmare. Um, and and uh, so I urge everybody to take a look. We'll discuss it next week and whatever you can contribute um, in terms of contacts or ideas, please contact me, okay? Uh, but um, we'll get a con. I mean, it's it's hair pulling. It's b believe me, it couldn't be worse. Uh, Susan Pinchon, have you joined us from Florida? If not, it's okay. We're going to move on. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, I had a whole list of things to cover. We have just uh, 35 minutes left. This national shortage of poll, poll workers is is serious. Again, we want to um, be uh, we we our, our next phase will hopefully be to produce some PSAs that can go generic, go around the country. Um, we, th this is a generational shift, as we've mentioned. You know, polls have been worked by older people like me in their 70s, and that's not gonna happen this year. And the young people are not coming forward. And we, we need to ex exert great um, uh, pressure and, and urging to all young people who marched uh, for George Floyd, and there were millions of people in the streets, Everybody needs to come into the polls and be poll workers. And uh, the pay is actually pretty good. Uh, the lowest I've heard is $11 an hour, and it's up to 20 in some cases. And there's no reason 
why we can't uh, have young, young people coming out to the polls. It's the most important thing going on right now. And, um, uh, and also, uh, Bernie Sanders has made a statement, <clears throat> which uh, again, we posted through um, uh, Grassroots EP, and it's at freepress.org in the election section, um, that uh, he thinks that um, uh, Biden is losing because he's not appealing to the young vote. And, you know, we all recall that at the Democratic Convention, they had four Republicans, including the former Republican governor of Ohio, <clears throat> and just a minute for AOC. So this is a, an issue with, with young people. And again, you know, we have to find the answer to get them in to work the polls and to protect the polls as well as to vote. Um, this NVI mailing, I'm gonna leave that for next week, this confusing mailing unless somebody has something to say about it, that this group, uh, allegedly an election protection group, has been mailing out uh, very confusing um, uh, ballot applications that aren't valid. <clears throat> if you get one of these, if you know people <clears throat> who are getting them, please contact us because we want to deal with them. <clears throat> Sorry. There's a group called the Democratic uh, Association of Secretaries of State that's being pushed by Obama and Eric Holder. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they're doing. If anybody does, please let me know. Uh, Alicia Keys uh, has headlined um, a uh, special that's over an hour, and I watched it. Uh, they've raised $5 million. There's another seven. They want two more. And all it does is assure people that it's safe to um, vote at home. Um, I don't know. You can take a look at it. Me, personally, I think the, the money might have been better spent on just getting grassroots people into work the polls, which they did not talk about, by the way. Uh, you might want to take a look at that. We're still working on Michael Moore, trying to get him to do PSAs. Um, the arena voting is proceeding, uh, uh, which is a, a good thing, um, and as we see in Charlotte and elsewhere. I had a complaint from someone in Michigan, who I thought was going to be on the, phone, on the line, but I guess he didn't get on, uh, saying there are no yard signs. Um, I don't know if anybody's seeing yard signs in your neighborhoods, um, uh, but to have no yard signs in Michigan uh, is oh, quite me. extraordinary. Uh, yes. Me. It's Brian. Oh, yeah, it's there Brian. you are. I'm yard sign guy. <laughs> yeah. I work with Jan too, but I'm yard sign guy, I guess, for this talk. And, and you're in Michigan, you're in Ann Arbor? Uh, Ann Arbor, Ipsy, I mean, you know, all over the Southeast Michigan. Well, basically. tell us what you're doing real quick. It's very interesting. Well, yeah, well, um, I, I did, did a bunch of things. I'm working with Jan. We're actually doing a lot of things. Uh, one of the bigger things is we're getting drop boxes for absentee voting in Michigan. How are you getting drop boxes? Well, we started, well, I, I can go into it a little bit, but we started the drop box project. We advocated to get drop boxes in uh, Detroit, which had zero drop boxes for absentee voting. They now are going to have 32 drop boxes. Uh, anyway, I, I, I talk about lawn signs, but I'm talking about drop boxes too. Um, yeah, so that, that's what we've kind of right. spent the last five the months. Drop, you, you got to drop boxes by advocating with the election board? We called uh, probably about 400 of our 1,500 clerks. We, have, we did a survey inventory of drop boxes. We put drop boxes on the map, on the issue during COVID when no one was even in their office and it became a big thing. So we, we you know, Detroit, which has 485,000 voters, 85% African American by demographic by the census had zero drop boxes. The smallest jurisdiction with 25 voters, a small town hall, has a drop box for voters in Michigan. Okay. But but okay, just so that's one of the things we worked on, and that's a big thing. And but we got them to spend to spend the CARES Act money. Yeah, on drop boxes. So you succeeded in getting drop boxes, so that could happen in other states. Yeah. Now, so, now you uh, tell us very quickly because we're really short. Yeah, tell, I'll, what, I just what, what's your big... yard sign pro project? Uh, what was that? Your yard uh, sign project. What's your what? Yeah, what yeah, so your... Uh, right now, I mean, a lot of large signs, especially by Trump voters, uh, the Biden signs are getting stolen. I don't see a lot of yard signs. The Democratic Party and the big party isn't putting out large signs. So I'm sort of created a, my own project where I'm buying yard signs, getting them out to people for cost. And I just need enough to get 
to make an order. I mean, basically daylight's burning, we're not getting them out. And because there's less options, people don't, we're not having rallies, there's no events, there's no door knocking. Yard signs have become kind of the central expression for people to express themselves to, I mean, yard signs are for a candidate, but really they say vote number one. So it really is vote and also vote for this candidate. So it really is a get out the vote encouragement 100 percent and of course it's about a particular candidate you have found you have found a union company the prince yard yep, a union company in flint, michigan. The democrats flint michigan i can get them in seven uh, five to seven days uh and i can get them for i think like three to four dollars i just need enough to get a good bulk order in and i want to get them going and we have tons of people who either had their signs stolen or they can't get a sign they're not available so burning daylight here. I want to get these signs available. I can put an order in today. I, you know, honestly looking okay, for around. Okay, so this will be true. This will be true in other states. You successfully found a union printer that does yard signs way cheaper than the Democrats and way faster. Okay. Or, so well, that's, maybe that's, that's what they're getting them for, but they're selling them on Biden's site for $25 a lawn <laughs> sign. I can get it to them for like three or four or whatever and get it to them like in a couple days. And they can use this this shop for any other state too if you really want to. If you okay, that's them, good. So if whatever. You, put your uh, contacts in the chat, please. Okay, okay. so we're and, and thank you for doing that. That's yeah, fun. thanks. And also, yeah, just quick about the Dropbox. It's really great. If your jurisdictions, if your municipalities have time to get Dropboxes available for voters, it's a one Dropbox per 15,000 to 20,000 registered voter standard. So if you have large jurisdictions that don't have a Dropbox more than their city hall, you can advocate to get them to get more Dropboxes, which are put in fire stations, rec centers, in other city property. That's what we did. And we got hundreds like lots of drop boxes put in big jurisdictions all over Michigan, including Ann Arbor, where I live, which has 105,000 voters, and they had one drop box, and now they're going to have seven installed all throughout town. So that's a great Dropbox success story. Great. If, you'll, if you'll write that up, that would be great. Also, no, there's been a request. Get, I'll, I can email you that, whatever. Or, yeah. yeah no, put it in the chat, and there's a request for the um, a contacts for that printer for the yard signs. Great. So I love we'll that. that in the chat too. We that also have good. a guy who will make drop boxes. Yes, we have a guy who makes drop boxes in Michigan. We'll send them out to you. They're How selling out. Drop These drop boxes are hard to get. Stain, he's stainless steel. He's a he's a fabricator. He knows how to do it. Uh, how much is a drop box? They go for well, it depends. But for a drop box that can fit a thousand to two thousand ballots, it goes for around two thousand dollars. So okay. at a fifteen thousand to two thousand registered voter standard, that's only seven and a half cents to ten cents per voter if they threw them out after one election. Two elections, okay. it's half. Three, it's th third. Okay. And these things That's are pennies, great. literally pennies. So they're worth it. And this is easy to vote by Dropbox. Obviously, 24-7, COVID safe, no lines. If you have your absentee ballot, you can bring it. I vote by Dropbox. So, Okay. It, Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, so if you want to, yeah, please. Anyway, okay. I'm well, a big put Dropbox the, Put the contacts so, in the chat. We I have a, a Jan has asked uh, from California, how can people uh, uh, call into the swing states? Um, we have a number of groups. Uh, there was a group of 30 people from Topanga. I put them in touch with Andrea Miller uh, at P people uh, demanding action. So this is a generic question for people who are not in swing states who want to uh, impact swing states. The group um, uh, I've been um, uh, recommending is Andrea Miller's People Demanding Action. They have phone banking and postcards. Uh, does anyone else have a group that they want to recommend real quickly for out of for non swing state activists to get involved and then we're going to jump in to the big debate the, the general discussion. Yeah, Anybody I else do want to recommend another group. Yes. Yeah, uh, field team six is doing an incredible job all over the country of getting all of doing all kinds of uh, get the vote out things in swing states. Uh, they're concentrating on swing states, but they have others as well. Can you put their contacts in the chat. I sure will. Please. Uh, okay. What's it called? Field Team Six. They used to be so Southern California Swing Left or something, but they changed their name to Field Team Six lately, and they're, they've been really, really effective in 2018 and now. Okay. And so National Voter Corps, nationalvotercorps.org, and they are supplying help to all over the country, whereas Andrea is focusing on the South. And here in Michigan, we're getting their help to do a giant postcard project. So they're great. All right, will you put them in the, uh, in the uh, chat box too, please? 
and I will post them at the, at the grassrootsep.org. Jan, if you put that group in the chat box. Anybody else have a group for out of state, non swing state people to plug in and do phone banking and, and postcards and stuff like that? I mean, it used to be California sent a, a caravan to Arizona. <laughs> I have a, I have a lot of I have a couple Harvey. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so through grassrootsdems.org, if you said we've got voter, I mean, we've got for swing states, we've got at, like we're just about to launch a massive one in Florida, aligning with Florida Dems, and we have big volunteer numbers, and that's also into Arizona. Again, I also want to echo what was said about fieldteam6.org fabulous organization and voterunlead.org in terms of get out the vote and for amazing training just excellent script writing but grassrootsdems.org i'll put it in the chat through them we're partnering with them and we've got swings we're mobilizing huge swing state voting from california all right so let's do this all of you who have mentioned groups if you will get a representative from each of these groups to come on our call next week, then they can explain in person what they do, okay? And Charlie Cray has uh, said that Greenpeace is working on climate concern voters. Uh, that's real good, and we were on, on a we had a Greenpeace call uh, already, so I have Charlie again next week. But if you will get every group that you think is good to present next week, because uh, this is a common question, especially in California, okay? Is that cool? And we have uh, another group, Westside Dems HQ, that's doing basically the same thing as grass as the grassroots. Uh, so that, but that's a group that our club is a member of. So I'll get you the information from them, and maybe I can get uh, a bunch of the Democratic clubs got together and did that. So I'll try to get one of the Dem Club presidents on the call. Next Good. Week. Okay. So that'll be, uh, that'll be a major piece of next week's uh, gathering. Will be these these groups will present so that you can choose your out-of-state groups, which ones you want to plug into. Uh, Harvey? Yes. Yeah, I was going to let people know that they, they can join me on my Zoom after this call so that I can show them the tools that we've developed to get out the vote in battleground states. Okay, and who is that speaking? Oh, Annabelle Park. Oh, Annabelle, that's what I thought. Okay, Annabelle, yeah. thank you so much. I just put the Zoom link in there. Okay. All right, great. Um, okay, uh, Susan Pinchon, last state report I see you're on. Is there anything quick you can tell us about Florida? Okay, maybe I'm missing her. All right, so uh, Bob Fatrakis, a, a lot of the um, discussion, and we now have oh. exactly- uh, Harvey? Yeah, oh, Susan, oh, yes. I, oh, I'm sorry, I had unmuted, but um, I guess it didn't take. Can you can hear me now? Yeah, real quick, can you give us a couple okay. minutes on Florida, then we're gonna go into a general discussion. Yes, um, Florida, there's, um, we're still hard at work on ballot images in Florida. Um, next week, I'll have more to report to you. Uh, we've also developed a letter with um, Muriel uh, McCarthy, who's on this call also, um, for people to send out to their election officials uh, requesting that they save ballot images. That could become critical, Harvey, in this election, but particularly if the vote by mail ballots are questioned to have those ballot images to be able to go back to to show that those are legitimate votes is really an important Okay, you're breaking up, Susan. So okay. we've made some progress in different states. Pardon? Yes, okay, yes. Okay, the, the anyway, more next week. And Please, and this is a national issue. We have an attorney on the phone um, who can speak up if he want. And Ray Lutz, you have a hand. You're, you're um, uh, a real expert on this. What are we doing nationwide to protect the ballot images? Is there a generic program to protect ballot images uh, that, that, and, and where they're, where they're going to be everywhere? Well, uh, the first step is get, uh, getting them made. It looks like in the top 10 states, we've got 99 plus percent of the states actually making the ballot images in the top counties. Second step will be to getting them to not delete them. And that work by John Brakey's group has been great for that. And the third step will be actually to get them. Um, and I, I'm not, uh, the, the protecting them from being deleted by the election officials, that's, um, <laughs> that's a legal matter. Um, I'd just like to announce that we're going to be uh, putting out a press release and a press conference this week about our audit engine um, platform. 
uh, that we're going to be offering for anybody to use. And that, what that does is a full ballot image tabulation with all the ballots um, uh, without relying upon the election officials. And the second thing is a new deal that we're just working on. It's called CrowdWatch. Um, this is where uh, CrowdWatch.org is not up yet, but essentially with your smartphone, you can go out taking pictures of the election officials, uh, maybe the ballot boxes. Um, we're concerned about bogus ballot boxes being put out and people directed to a ballot box where the ballots are not ever uh, recovered. Uh, and so that's something we want to look at. Um, the, so we don't quite know how it's going to work out in terms of what the pictures are going to be good. But the idea is that people on the ground will take snapshots and put them up to their website. Other people will just review to see if they uh, yeah, make sure that they're not um, spam. And then it goes into this crowd um, sourced um, <clears throat> reviewing platform called Zooniverse. And what that does is lets um, people from wherever take a look at the pictures and then just uh, escalate them to suspicious. Or, you know, if we see people with um, dropping a whole bunch of ballots off or, or license plates uh, over and over and over at these ballot boxes, um, that's kind of what we're trying to, <laughs> to put in, increase the, the threshold for, for people. So I'll thank let you know more about that as we get closer. All right, thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. Uh, there are people working. I, I think we need nationally a generic uh, protocol to be able to inspect and guarantee that these um, um, uh, ballot imaging machines are not hacked. There's never a reason to connect a ballot imaging machine to the internet, <clears throat> but we also have to go to each one and make sure that they're va va validly taking uh, the correct kind of pictures and that uh, they're being they're being dealt with properly. This uh, every virtual this election will be counted primarily on ballot imaging machines, and we yeah. need and there aren't that many different makes, so we need <clears throat> a generic core to be able to inspect and and verify that these ballot imaging machines are doing what they're supposed to do, and so that's something we're going to have to work on. Um, as we proceed through the next seven weeks. Well, the okay. good news though uh, here, Harvey, is that once we get the ballot images, most of the hacking that we're worried about happens after the ballot images are, are already um, completed. So all of the um, you know, potential hacks to the, the central tabulator like fraction magic and the like, those are all eliminated. Um, but uh, yeah, so certainly we want to make sure that the ballot images are, are correct too. But right. that, that, I, that, I think that's, that's, that's worth a lot of discussion and a lot of core work. And you've been thank doing, you. doing, Ray, you and Susan and uh, John Breaking have been doing that. We got to be aware of that. Okay, we have uh, 17 minutes left. Um, um, we did a lot of state by state, but all that stuff is generic and extremely important. Everybody who contributed to that, thank you very, very much. Uh, the other piece, and we're seeing more and more discussion now about what happens if the uh, person in the White House does not accept the, um, uh, the outcome. You know, the first reality is you have to, you have to win the outcome. If, uh, if, the, if Trump wins the election, it all becomes moot. But people do, so uh, that's the number one priority, obviously. But there's also discussion now um, about what to do if uh, he doesn't win the election or if he's clearly rigged it and uh, people need to resist. So um, Bob Petrakis and I have talked a lot about the one tactic that we think uh, uh, would be most effective uh, for nonviolent national resistance. Uh, Bob, you wanna talk about the general strike? Uh, yeah, just quickly, I also see uh, Gary Crane is on the call and he's been pushing apps for this as well. But uh, uh, just briefly in modern history, uh, I mean, we, we got the 10 hour day thanks to the workers of Philadelphia in 1835 who went on a general strike for three weeks. Uh, some of you may know 1828, the first workers party in the world came out of Philadelphia's way. Uh, the railroad strike of 1877, where they had to call in the U.S. Army uh, to break it. Uh, the tremendous strikes in the 1930s in labor. Uh, Minneapolis, uh, of course, the fame of Flint sit-down, which was much more uh, like an Occupy. 
So uh, remember at, at Ford, when the workers uh, called for bread, Ford fed them lead. That's the problem on being on the outside. So what we need to think about is uh, what is going to be the target? Uh, is it going to be an Occupy, uh, particularly uh, indoors of some sort, or some other strategic tactic uh, that can force Trump uh, to leave office. Some of you uh, may have seen the very long article in the New York Times yesterday uh, regarding uh, the militias. Uh, you know, I'm in Ohio, so I run across them uh, regularly. So the broader question is, how do you mobilize quickly? What, if anything, would we be asking people to do? Uh, and one thing I think is uh, we need to ask our public officials, including our Secretary of State and uh, our governors, senators, et cetera, uh, what's the plan if Trump doesn't leave? Uh, also, we should be at, uh, asking about safety plans and public records. These boards of elections should have a safety plan uh, if there is, in fact, militia showing up. But the article in the Times was uh, interesting. And of course, uh, uh, Gary has talked about the apps. How do we mobilize people? What are our targets if uh, he pulls a Mussolini? He's got the gestures and he's capable <laughs> of uh, you know, doing that. So the question also is what happens if the militias or, or Trump's, uh, Trump orders troops into the election boards to take the ballots and just trash the uh, trash the outcome uh, outright. When when um, uh, Roger Stone talked about uh, martial law, he was specifically talking about the elections in Nevada and Florida. And you could you could imagine Trump sending troops into the election boards into those two states. Uh, that might be sufficient to flip the election. So uh, Gary Crane, did you want to add something here? And then we'll open it up to everybody. Sure. Um, can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so thank you, Bob, for for uh, putting in a plug for our work. I just want to mention: I, about two weeks ago, I sent most of the people on the call an article by George Lakey, who is the nation's leading expert on nonviolent civil resistance, particularly direct action, uh, with a great book, by the way, called "How We Win." And Lakey, uh, I posted a link to that article. Again, if you just scroll up, you'll see a long chat from me. Um, sorry, I always write too long. Anyhow, uh, he, he, basically makes the he basically makes the argument that um, if you look at democracies that have been able to thwart coups, uh, they've almost always done so by being able to start organizing, mobilizing, very large mass of nonviolent civil resistance uh, movements right away. And th that often scares the right wing and they give up. They decide to call off the coup. Uh, so it's important, and I put in some of the names of the organizations that two or three largest coalitions of election protection groups, they need to really be woken up to be starting to do this. One is called Protect the Results, which has, uh, Set about 72 major organizations from Move On to Greenpeace to Indivisible. It was actually started by Indivisible and Stand Up America. Stand Up America has 2 million members alone. Um, so I, but people should probably contact me and then I can put you, I can give you a language to use or whatever you want to do to contact these. And I can give you the uh, email contacts for almost all these people. The other big coalition, of course, is America Votes. And I just think we'd be terribly naive to think that all we have to do is help uh, Biden get an overwhelming number of people to vote for him and, uh, and therefore uh, he will win the presidency. There's so many ways which Bob and Harvey know about that could lead to a 12th Amendment scenario uh, despite all of our best efforts uh, to get all the purge voters back, to get people to actually vote for Biden, to not people make mistakes with provision, all the things you've been talking about, we do everything right, and they could still all too easily steal the election because if it goes to the House of Representatives, the Republicans control 30 of uh, our 51 state legislatures, every state gets only one vote. 
Um, so we just cannot let that happen. And the only way we can prevent that is the way we've done every great change in this country, which is massive nonviolent civil resistance. Not just the eight hour day, but women's right to vote, civil rights movement, the Vietnam movement, every major movement has always required massive nonviolent civil resistance. This will be the second revolution, hopefully nonviolent, but we've got to be organizing it now. We're already way too late. Okay, thank you, Gary. And, and, and you know, the point of Bob's presentation and the, the history of the general strike is that it, it, you cannot make a, a definitive change uh, just by marching in the streets. Uh, there, there needs to be work stoppages. There has to be a demonstration on the part of the general population of an ability to shut down the country. So, so marching, we've seen gargantuan marches starting with the day after uh, Trump was inaugurated, uh, and we're, here we are, even after the George Floyd marches. Tremendous changes came um, because of the George Floyd marches, especially in the public uh, mind. But uh, in terms of the uh, actual levers of power, the, only, the thing that has worked most effectively in history has been to shut down the entire economy. Um, uh, and that, that's a general strike and that needs to enter the um, a discussion as far as I can tell. Does anyone else, uh, we have open time here for an open forum. We've had a really packed agenda. These calls are really exhausting, but nobody has left. We have more, more people on the call now than we did when we began. So, um, and those state-by-state -state reports are absolutely critical. They do give us generic issues and we need to know what's going on. Uh, did, so Har has, does anyone else, uh, Dorothy, go ahead. So Sasha Abramsky has a very comprehensive article in The Nation describing the plans for, uh, for not only people in the streets, but a general strike and for people staying in the streets, a Belarus kind of um, situation plus a general strike and it, she lists all the organizations. Um, uh, Greg uh, mentioned a few of them and it, it's an interesting article to read and I, I you know, he's basic or I mean, uh, Bob mentioned a few of them. So, but can you give us the link to the um, thing there's there's just people are just going to pour out of their houses and it, they're going to do what refused fascism told us to do four years ago but we wouldn't listen because they were a revolutionary communist party. So, um, but now it looks like we're gonna have to follow their blueprint. Okay, if you can uh, post the uh, link to that, that would be great or we'll find it. It won't be hard to find. Harvey, uh, I'm Harvey, Ma Harvey. Ma Mandeep came first and Susan. Okay. And then, and then um, someone Dr. Else. Laura. Okay, this should be pretty Dr. quick. Laura. What, okay, what I um, posted, I already posted the link. So there's already, um, not a general strike, but a plan for this in three days. Uh, I came across this recently. So these folks are going to be surrounding the White House. It's like Occupy. And it's just, we should all know about it. Those who are in D.C., if you don't know, if you don't have a job, which is one of the reasons the Floyd protests were successful. So many people lost their jobs and could be in the street long term, as Dorothy just mentioned. Um, I think we should know about this and the rest of us should plan for general strike and those other things as we go on in time. Okay, thank you. Rebecca? And then uh, who was next? Mine is a question that um, refers back to our last meeting. Can I get information on who was doing the suing of local county secretary of elections to make sure they're following the federal mandate to require images? I'm running into a lot of down ballot candidates in Georgia now who have a big fear about this, like in district six and in district five. And I'd like to, I, I really appreciate the letter um, templates, and I'll be using those and passing those along, but I know that there was talk about... Could I, could I address that? Could I address yes, that quickly, please. Harvey? Yes, please. Um, John, John Brakey, um, I work closely with John um, Audit USA, and we have been, um, have efforts in many states on ballot images. If you have information, if you could forward that to um, John Brakey at Gmail, or to me at Susan Pinchon at Gmail. Um, okay, have, I will. We have, I will we, have a lawsuit in, we, we have a lawsuit in Florida. We've had lawsuits in other states. And um, we are doing whatever we can to make sure that those ballot images get saved. But okay. I would say ours is the most comprehensive national effort in that regard. Fantastic. Thank you, Susan. I'm in contact with John, and I will also write to you as well. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. 
Uh, Ruth Strauss, I, I believe you have the next hand, Ruth. Thank you, Rebecca. Hey, um, Harvey, about those of us who uh, have reached the uh, level of sophistication that we cannot be poll we workers or should not be, is there somewhere where uh, you or Mimi or someone can list what the things are that we can do, such as I would be happy to go to monitor vote counting or um, do uh, monitor the, um, you know, when they disqualify ballots for signatures and stuff like that. Is there somewhere that you all can post uh, either where we can go to find out what we can do or actually ideas of what we can do? Well, go Harvey, ahead. Could I, yes, someone else. Someone else could, could I address, this is Susan again, sorry. Please, and please, I'll just go. make this really quick. Um, Scrutineers.org. Uh, Emily Levy's group um, has a number of suggestions. Also, Harvey, I'd be willing to make a list of those things for your next meeting so that you can share those Please. with people. Yes. Perfect. Fact, remember, we're going to meet every week now for the duration. So Thank some you, of the Susan. Stuff, if you want to make that more deep uh, for the f next week, that's perfectly great. Uh, Californians have traditionally gone to Arizona, and you can talk to John Brakey about, about uh, 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 Phoenix. So, uh, Joel Siegel. Can you hear me okay, Harvey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, so in North Carolina, in Mecklenburg County, in order to be able to contest the votes, the law is, and, and I, I'm a lawyer, and, and so is you know Bob Petrakis, and there might be some other lawyers here, but it's very fuzzy. And I was going to ask Bob, to, you know, based on your years and years of doing this, what, what Greg Palast is saying is that the Republican playbook will be to, they're going to contest the votes and say they're fraudulent. And Trump has not, he's actually, he telepath, he's tell, what do you call it when you, uh, not telepath. Telegraphing. 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 Telegraphing, yeah. So he's, he's letting us know what he's about, what they're about to do. But the question I have for you is Greg Palast said we have to contest the contesters. So what's the law of contesting the vote? And then what's the law of contesting the contesters? Because in Florida, 2000, Harvey was talking about this the other day, when, when Judge Kavanaugh and his right wing, you know, mob, they just went to, uh, was it, I guess, Dade, Miami-Dade County, and they- Broward, Dade, yeah, the, yeah the, they, four, they, the four big counties in the South. Yeah, they, they stormed the Bastille and demanded that they didn't recount. And somehow the Supreme Court went along with the, the lynch mob, which I'll never understand. But what, what's your scenario, Bob, in terms of A, who, who could contest it and then how do we contest the contesters? Like what's the law, what controls? Well, the, uh, yeah, the Brooks Brothers riot, as it was known. Um, so we, got, we got two minutes. Yeah, uh, again, a lot of this comes down uh, state by state and, and with the boards of control and has to be known in advance. For example, in Ohio, we've got a federal ruling that you can't challenge anybody unless you know them. But if that's going to, I mean, because people were showing up, uh, some in Brooks Brothers suits, uh, you know, the young Republicans uh, for capitalism, uh, also, what was happening in a lot of areas, people were prepared, particularly in the inner cities. And, uh, you know, I saw some guys running very fast in Brooks Brothers suits back to their cars when they came in to challenge people uh, in the inner city. There was a bit of uh, self-help and people sticking and they're, to they're different, And there are different laws, and every state has different laws about that, so there's no one universal law that covers that subject well and a lot of it is so is, you need to check the board board do it? you know and the thing is to go there ahead of time they should have a plan uh that's written up so we need that starting with the large boards of election the large counties we need to figure out what in the hell their plan is right okay. and, and well, people can google more people can google yeah. the law in their own state <laughs> just, just google you know, Virginia statute election challenge, and you'll come, or North Carolina uh, uh, election challenge statute, and you'll oh, come talk up about this so you can know. Let's do this in detail. Okay. Next, week. Next week, we'll okay. do it in great detail. Uh, Laura, Laura Chamberlain, last, last word. Yes. 
Absolutely. Greg Palace was on the radio here in Chicago uh, yesterday, and he um, said that he is he's tried to contact National Dems, and they're just really unwilling to talk about this, but that he did sit down with um, Kamala Harris two weeks ago and kind of outlined the, you know, dangerous scenarios here. So I think it would be worthwhile, um, you know, uh, tweeting Kamala to get more involved in this. Uh, he hasn't gotten any positive response from the Dems, the Democratic Party on the national level. I think we should... I think we should tweet, tweet Harris is what I'm recommending to everybody. You know, hey, listen, this is, here's what we think might happen. You know, are you guys considering this? That kind of thing. Twitter storm. So listen, Twitter all this we're going to continue next week. This has just been action-packed. We have more people on now than when we started. Uh, thank you, Mike Hurst. Thank you, Joel Siegel, uh, Bob Fetrakis, everybody, uh, uh, Kenny Bruno for uh, making this possible. And we're just going to barrel through anything you want on next week's call. <clears throat> Email me. You'll get your notices on Friday and then over the weekend. And uh, we will reconvene. But certainly going to talk with all the groups, any group that's doing uh, a work that can be plugged into by people from out of state, have them representative, represented. And, um, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll save this election, folks. What choice do we have? Okay. See you, see you next week, everybody. Thank you, Mike Hirsch. And um, uh, thank you, Steve Caruso. And uh, God help us. Let's save this election.